Good evening, good evening. I love the sound of forks on plates and wonderful conversation in this beautiful space. Welcome, 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 welcome again. We all made it over here. And, and wouldn't you know it, we walk outside and the rain stops. But I'm so grateful for your presence. I'm delighted, again, to share this evening with some of our, our most committed and generous friends and neighbors of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. This is truly a special evening because it's the first time we have stepped back to collectively admire this landscape of development that's happening out here on our peninsula. And if you're not as proud as I am about this space, um, you're going to get it before the night is over. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's something special happening out here in Boston on this peninsula. And if you're not ready for it, it's just going to just swoop you up. <laughs> and you, tonight is our opportunity to applaud the pioneering collaboration of the people and the institutions who share a vision for the boundless potential our location offers as a hub of culture and a hub of opportunity for Boston, this Commonwealth, and for the world. Speaking of the world, someone who has really helped our world move forward in a lot of ways, just walked in the door, Vicki Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Dr. Vicki Kennedy, University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a few others, but we won't mention those. But why are we here tonight? We're here to thank you, our Founders Circle members, for your unbelievable support of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thank you. This tradition began in 2008 when we inaugurated this esteemed group of donors whose generous philanthropy makes possible the university's biggest and highest aspirations. I am glad so many of you are here tonight to celebrate. People like Patricia Flaherty that's here, all the way up from Florida to a point where I'm like, dude, are you back in Boston now? <laughs> we appreciate it. Jacqueline Fawcett, who is here tonight, thank you. Corcoran Jennison, Perkins School for the Blind, Autism Speaks, the Peter and Carolyn Lynch Foundation, State Street Bank, <laughs> the Boston Globe, and on and on and on. But I'd also say, Peggy Wood, you know you are welcome on this campus. Anytime, Dr. Wood's legacy just sort of swoops, swings around the University of Massachusetts system and lands out here on Boston. And we're so grateful to have you and your daughter in our presence tonight. Thank you so much for being. Stand up so we can see you. You're still looking good. I know, I saw you. Bus came up, she wanted to walk over here. <laughs> Every day, we pay tribute publicly to the Founders Circle members through a graceful recognition on our wall in our campus center, which reminds students, faculty, staff, and others about a legacy we've long cherished. The University of Massachusetts Boston's achievements have been made possible through its engaging alliances with and the financial investment of its multi-bordered communities. So tonight, we embrace members of this community, particularly people like our, our newly elected state representative, Nick Collins, who couldn't be here, but his mom is here. Where's mom at? Where's mom? She was here. Did she leave? Oh, she's downstairs working. Okay, mom is working, but Nick, could, he couldn't be here. Working on his re-election re already. <laughs> Our unbelievable partnership with the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Right here, Tom, stand up so we can see you. 
the soon to come Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. Yeah, 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 woohoo, woohoo. We're gonna get to that in a minute. We'll have a, a few more woohoos in a minute. The Mass Archives Commonwealth Museum, where we are right now. And the other friends that we're so honored to have, representatives from tonight. Harbor Point Community, Double Tree Hotels, Shaw's, Shaw's, Shaw's Supermarket, the Devers School, the Frederick Public Schools, Youth Build, Youth Options Limited, and the first community health center in the United States, Geiger Gibson Community Health Center, located right here on this peninsula. All of our neighbors out here doing wonderful things together. This is going to be an unbelievable destination point for this city, and we can't wait to get started with thinking about how that all begins on that other side, down there on that bay side, Ellen O'Connor, very, very soon. We know how excited these friends are, and so many, many are, others are about the burgeoning growth which surrounds us. From the creation of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, which will invigorate public discourse and inspire the next generation of citizens and leaders, and the university soon to be built integrated science complex and our new academic building, which will extend intellectual horizons to the expansive possibilities afforded by our acquisition of the Bayside property that I spoke of. Our peninsula is expanding its footprint of influence and possibility for citizens near and far. We deeply appreciate the generous spirit of collaboration displayed by this array of neighbors. And we're especially grateful for the hospitality of the John F. Kennedy Library and the Commonwealth Museum, whose collections are reacquainting us with the power inherent in expanded public access to history. We were saying over there at that reception about how moving it was just to walk around in those spaces. And now we come tonight here to the archives and you're in for a treat. If you have some time at the end, you need to go through this exhibit here. I'm going to go through with you after these speeches, et cetera. We're going to have a great time down there. So we're indebted to Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Library and Museum, and also Stephen Kenny, director of the Commonwealth Museum for, their share, for sharing their galleries. Thank you tonight for doing that. And so, on with what we're here for tonight. Tonight's celebration is immeasurably enriched by two honored guests. Our speaker, one of our dearest leaders, chairperson of the board of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, attorney Kenneth Feinberg. Let's give him a round of applause. but also a cherished university friend and this year's honorary degree recipient, Vicki Kennedy. <laughs> Both of these individuals have touch, been touched by most intimate encounters with living history, and it is a privilege that they're able to be with us tonight. Thank you again to each of you who are our most valued partners. You are the individuals, corporations, and the foundations who generously provide the resources to transform our aspirations into achievement. You are the community partners that enable us to extend these achievements to the widest possible audience, so they inspire profound social and cultural change. And now, <laughs> I want to introduce someone who is near and dear to our hearts. She is a staunch advocate for women, children, and families, and a steadfast leader of efforts to protect those at risk from hand gun violence. Many know her as the caring and charismatic wife of our much beloved and esteemed Senator Ted Kennedy. 
in whose memory the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate is being developed right here on this campus. From her childhood in a politically active family in Louisiana or Louisiana, <laughs> to her outstanding academic performance as a young person graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Tulane University and Summa Summa Cum Laude <laughs> from Tulane Law School to her stellar 17-year career as an attorney specializing in banking and finance, she has stood out for her drive and tireless commitment to excellence. I'm delighted to introduce you to tonight the 2010 recipient of the University of Massachusetts Boston Honorary Doctorate of Laws, Victoria Reggie Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen. I know why this entire peninsula is on the move. <laughs> it has Keith Motley there just doing, leading the charge. Don't you feel energized? <laughs> I sure do. Thank you so much, Chancellor Motley, for that introduction. And thank you for your leadership of UMass Boston. Thank you for all you do for this incredible Columbia Point for this magnificent peninsula for your good neighbor ship. <laughs> That's a word, I like it. And uh, this really, seriously, this magnificent peninsula is going to be the go-to destination of Boston. It is becoming that, it is the most dynamic, energized place to be, and um, in no small measure because of your leadership. Thank you, Thank Keith. You. Thank you. It is a tremendous honor for me to be here and to have this opportunity tonight to introduce our speaker, an extraordinary man who truly exemplifies the nobility of public service in the tradition of President Kennedy and his younger brother, Teddy, <laughs> and indeed all their brothers and sisters, and which the University of Massachusetts works so hard to instill in its students. I can think of no one like our speaker in American society today, a private citizen of such immense skill, integrity, trustworthiness, and recognized ability that he is called upon by both Republican and Democratic presidents and captains of industry to help navigate some of our nation's most difficult crises. What an act of patriotism. What a gift of himself and his incomparable skills of mediation when Ken Feinberg agreed to administer the 9-11 fund and to do it pro bono. Republicans and Democrats in Congress and President Bush knew that Attorney General John Ashcroft had chosen the perfect man to perform the impossible job. And there's been so much more. He's worked to accelerate payments to homeowners after Hurricane Katrina, compensate families after the mass murders at Virginia Tech, persuade executives to reduce their pay in the midst of a financial crisis and government bailouts. After all, he was the pay czar. <laughs> And he's currently administering claims under the BP Trust Fund after the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. These are not happy jobs, none of them, but they are necessary jobs. And they require skills that very few people possess. Indeed, I think no one other than Ken could successfully do them. He has patience, empathy, brilliance, and the ability to find common ground. And a grateful nation can never thank him enough. But for all these important public roles that Ken has played, there are more personal ones on my mind, especially because they mattered so much to my husband. First, the education of another generation about his brother, 
and the work of the JFK Library were very important to Teddy. And he would have been so pleased to see Ken at the helm of the JFK Library Foundation. Because you see, Teddy knew that JFK's legacy would be in good hands with Ken Feinberg. Ted Kennedy respected Ken Feinberg. He trusted Ken Feinberg. He relied on Ken Feinberg. He loved Ken Feinberg. Ken had been one of the super lawyers on Teddy's staff, and he became Teddy's chief of staff and trusted advisor and lifelong pal. And I got lucky, and Ken became my pal and trusted advisor too. I love Ken Feinberg. I love his wife, Dee Dee, and all three of their children. The Feinberg clan is family for us. And in the last challenging months of Teddy's life, and in the empty ones for me since he's been gone, Ken Feinberg has been there for me, always. He's an extraordinary human being. He has never stopped asking what he can do for his country or for his friends. How lucky we all are to know him and how lucky we are to have him with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's distinguished speaker, my friend, a true American patriot, the incomparable, the one, the only, <laughs> Ken Feinberg. Wow, Th thank you, thank you very much. Um, only Vicki Kennedy can bring a tear to my eye that way. I mean, she is one extraordinary lady, lawyer, scholar, educator, public citizen, civic-minded. Um, the chancellor says she really is from Louisiana. Don't you believe it? If there's anybody from Massachusetts, it's Vicki Kennedy. <laughs> I mean, we, we have adopted Vicki Kennedy. She's a Massachusetts person. Um, what she does day in and day out, on her own, mostly quietly, if you want to know the truth, little things that a lot of people don't know about, and helping and working with communities. Um, one of the first ladies of the Commonwealth. Thank you very, very much. Chancellor, with that introduction and that voice, you know, if you want to see a perfect example of how the chancellor, I mean, an example of what the chancellor is like. Go get the DVD of the man who shot Liberty Valance. <laughs> Some of you may remember this movie, John Ford Weston, with Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. And there is a scene at the end of that movie where they're trying to select the first senator from the territory. I think it's Oklahoma. The first, uh, the first, uh, so they have a, a convention in the movie. And I'll tell you, John, um, is it John uh, the, the Cassavetes, uh, gets up there and just, I think it's the Chancellor speaking. <laughs> I mean, it's fabulous. So, Chancellor, thank you very, very much. What you're doing for this place is unbelievable. And of course, my friend, uh, my colleague in a sense, uh, really, one of the moving forces of the JFK Library, my friend Tom Putnam. What a job he does over there, day in and day out. <laughs> part archivist, believe me, part shrink over there. I mean, <laughs> not easy. So, um, when I got the invitation from the Chancellor to speak here tonight, I jumped at the chance. Jumped didn't have to ask me twice. And there are very, very personal reasons why I wanted to be here this evening. Vicki mentioned one. This area of Boston is where it is. You are all charter members of an area of Boston that is going to be international, if not now, is soon to be, certainly internationally recognized. The buses are going to roll into here. Those buses are going to come, and you're going to have one ticket that will let you go from building to building. UMass will partner with the institute, with the library, education programs, forums, scholars in residence. It is going to be fabulous for UMass. 
It's going to be fabulous for the Institute, and it's going to be, it's going to be fabulous for the JFK Library. Other reasons I wanted to be here, very, very personal reasons. I graduated from UMass Amherst. I'm a 1967 BA graduate, majored in history at UMass. I still visit UMass Amherst. I still have my mentors from the history department who have retired but are still there, Milton Cantor, Mario DePillis, scholars who taught me American history in 1967 and prepared me for a career in the law and in public service. I am in UMass's debt. I will always be a, a son of UMass. And I just think that the UMass program, the UMass community, uh, extended throughout the Commonwealth, um, is nationally recognized, will continue to be recognized, and I want to, every day that I can, repay UMass for the education it provided a son of Brockton who graduated from the Brockton school system before Brockton was on the front page of the New York Times, I might add. <laughs> and I'm very, very grateful to the university. I'm also grateful because of the JFK Library and what that means to me. I grew up, like many of you, fueled in my eagerness to do public service by President Kennedy and that administration. I note with sorrow the passing of my friend uh, Ted Sorensen, one of the last legacies, a lot, one, of the, one of the final legacies of President Kennedy's administration. But for me, to be asked by Vicki and Caroline and Tom and the board to be the chairman of that foundation over there, replacing Paul, Senator Paul Kirk, is to me an unbelievable honor. And working over that library across the street and, and rummaging through the files and reading the old documents and, and hosting forums and listening to international speakers and most importantly, watching how under Tom's leadership and Vicki and Caroline and the others, we're able to make that library relevant, relevant not just as a museum, but as an uh, outreach to the community in Boston, in urban areas, to better understand the legacy of President Kennedy and what he meant to the country, and what he meant to the country. And then finally, to be here to acknowledge with you the coming of Senator Kennedy's Institute, the crowning glory of the whole area. Senator Kennedy was my mentor, my friend, and let me just say the obvious, and I, I, I mean no disrespect to any living politician to say, could we use Senator Kennedy these days? Could we use his ability to forge alliances and bipartisan agreements? And um, he's missed every day in this country, every day. But to be here at the genesis of the Institute, Peter Mead I don't think is here this evening, I didn't see Peter, but but to be working with Peter and Jack Connors and Vicki in making the Institute a reality in partnership with the university and the library, I mean, there will be nothing like it in our country. And if you're part of Shaw's, is the way you said it, <laughs> or the Boston Globe, the way you said it, I mean, to be here now and watch this all develop, I think is just a fabulous opportunity for the university and for the whole community. Now, Vicki mentioned some of these um, tragedies that I seem to get involved in in trying to solve or, or compensate. And you know, even though she mentioned my role as the Pezai, you know, that she loves to use that phrase. That is a very unfortunate phrase, Pezai, 
first of all, my grandmother in Lithuania would be very confused. <laughs> very confused. <laughs> Secondly, it makes it sound, you know, like uh, I was issuing imperial arbitrary edicts about pay, imposing them on corporate officials. That's not really what I did at all. We, we basically worked out consensually uh, almost all of those pay packages. Um, and I think uh, did some good, limited role that I had in that. I mean, it was a very narrow statute. But, but all of these problems, Agent Orange involving Vietnam veterans who were exposed to the herbicide in Vietnam, the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, the massacre at Virginia Tech, the pay uh, role that I had at TARP, and now this horrible environmental tragedy in the Gulf caused by the BP oil spill. In all of those areas, there is one common denominator. They're very different, but there's one common denominator. There are, fortunately, very few times in American history where policymakers like Senator Kennedy decide there's got to be a better way, a creative alternative to the traditional litigation court system. Now, I'm a lawyer, like Vicki. I happen to think that the, uh, the, um, our, our rule of law and our adversarial system in the courtroom works pretty well, frankly, day in and day out. But there are occasionally mass tragedies where policymakers come together in sort of a bipartisan way and say, for this one, we better think anew. Because asking everybody to hire a lawyer and go to court is not the most efficient, fairest way to compensate victims. And that's what gives rise to an Agent Orange settlement program, a statute passed by Congress 11 days after 9-11 that set up the Victim Compensation Fund. The $8 million Virginia Tech Voluntary Fund, funded by private contributions. The TARP program, passed by Congress in populist outrage to the financial debacle. And now BP, a private compact between the government and BP to fund a program $20 billion to pay the victims of the spill. Those are all different, but they're all aberrations. They're unique responses to unprecedented national tragedies. Take 9-11, one example. Congress passed that law 11 days after 9-11. Senator Kennedy, Dick Gebhardt, Chuck Schumer, the Bush administration, Tom Daschle, that was the group. That was the group. And Congress said that the 9-11 tragedy is so horrific, so unprecedented, rivaled only in American history by the Civil War, Pearl Harbor, and the assassination of President Kennedy, that there better be a unique response to that unprecedented tragedy. And I think Congress did the right thing in setting up this program. Anybody could voluntarily waive their right to sue. You can't go to court, but if you'll agree not to go to court, you'll have a, uh, a claim administered by uh, the Attorney General delegating to me and get paid on average tax-free $2 million. Everybody took it except 94 people. Everybody else came into the fund. Now, I say that that program will never be replicated, never. It was a one-off response by Congress to a unique event. And I say it was the right thing, and I think it was the right thing to do for those victims. But I got to tell you, it's a very, very close call. You should have read some of the emails I got when I was administering that program. Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son died in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? 
Mr. Feinberg, my daughter died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attacks committed by the very same people. Where's my check? And it didn't stop with terrorism. Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroine. Where's my check? You know, you got to be very, very careful about establishing these very generous programs when very bad things happen to good people every day in America and they don't get $2 million. I don't think you can justify the 9-11 program from the perspective of the victims. I certainly couldn't. The country saw 9-11 differently than any of these other tragedies. The country wanted to do something for these people. That's the only way to justify it. I think it was the right thing to do. It w I think it was the right thing to do. Senator Kennedy also said to me that day, he said, you know, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. Just make sure, Ken, that 90% of the money, all public money, doesn't go to 10% of the victims who worked on Wall Street. Make sure it's taxpayer money. I'm giving you some advice. Typical, great advice. <laughs> so that's, that, that's just how these things work. Now, Vicki made one telling error when she introduced me. She said that I'm the only person she knows of that could do this. That's not true. The, these programs that I administer are not rocket science. There are, I believe, thousands, maybe millions of Americans that could do this. It takes some ba backbone and some fortitude, but it's doing basically um, what a blueprint, what President Kennedy and Senator Kennedy and now Vicki Kennedy t teach us about public service. So um, I wanted to join you folks for a few minutes. Sort of I'm here at, at, at a time when things around here are exploding in the good. And, and this whole area, I'm part of it with Tom Putnam, with, Car with uh, Vicki and Caroline and the library, with the chancellor at my alma mater, UMass. And for me to be able to come back here tonight just for 15 minutes and thank you for all you do for my alma mater, UMass. It's a great, great time to be active in UMass. Chancellor, I thank you. I thank everybody for all you do for the university, and I'll try and get you free tickets to the library. So thank you. Now, we promised you, when you became a member of this Founders Circle, that we would have dynamic opportunities for sharing and learning and coming together. We also promised you on this peninsula that we would be partners and collaborators with you and that this place together, the way we can work together to make this place into all that we vision, can make this place second to none. And so we're so grateful to all of you for coming out this evening. Um, Ken, we're honored. We're honored by your presence. I am just grateful for your leadership and partnership out here on this peninsula. I am you know, so grateful that you made the commercial that you made for us tonight. <laughs> about this wonderful university that I've come to love. See, I came from another place, but I'm reformed now. <laughs> you know, I sort of got it. And once I got it, it made life so much easier for me in this leadership. It made it easier because of people like Marty, who's out here working with Corcoran Jennison. It made it easier because where's my dear friend, Charlotte Gola Ritchie, who's sitting back there now going on to be, she's had every role in the community. And now she's back as vice president, youth building and all that, and we're so grateful to you. Thank you for coming out tonight as well. Um, so Ken, 
Thank you for joining us tonight. Everyone who's joined us tonight on this peninsula for this celebration of the peninsula, thank you for coming out. I want to um, say we're getting ready to have dinner now. And when we complete dinner, then Stephen Kenny, the director, is going to meet us downstairs. We're going to be blocking the doors for some of you. <laughs> We want you to just take a brief tour of this museum and then go tell some children about it and others to bring their families. They will love it. This is just a bit of what we're doing on the peninsula. I hope you got it. Hope you're catching it. Let's enjoy the dinner and the fellowship. Thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>